Hello, class. Uh, this is the supplemental lecture for Unit 2. Hopefully you had a chance to look at the mini lecture for Unit 1. I think those of you that I talked to, it was helpful in preparing for the exam. As I mentioned in the first lecture, these are not intended to be thoroughgoing lectures where I go over every chapter the way I would in a face-to-face -face class or anything like that. This is still a reading-based course. But I do want to put together a mini lecture to help you with some of the learning objectives that I find most difficult or that past experience has shown to be among the most difficult for the unit. Now, this unit in general, I think, is the most difficult of the five units for History 1302, mainly because we deal with some economic concepts, not just the political spectrum, but uh, things like the Federal Reserve and stimulus spending and things like that that can be a little bit um, tedious and a little bit difficult to wrap one's mind around um, when you first hear about them. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in and just kind of give ourselves a little refresher here on this political spectrum that we introduced back in Unit 1 in, in the second chapter. Today, the left and the right, those words have all kinds of meanings, social, cultural, um, religious, you name it, and including economic implications. I want you to focus first on the economic implications here, especially at this point in the course, that to be on the right economically is to favor less government interference in the economy, more of a free market with fewer regulations, lower taxes, etc., generally favoring the rights of companies and corporations over workers or consumers. Whereas on the left, there's a little bit more of a push for government intervention on behalf of those workers and consumers. Higher taxes, greater redistribution of wealth in the economy, safety net for retirees, disabled workers, etc. So today we tend to associate the right with Republicans over here and the left with Democrats. You get further left, you get into democratic socialism. That can be a little bit of a sticky concept because sometimes people use the word socialism um, synonymously with communism over here on the far left. But the key difference with democratic socialism being that there's voting, people just vote for things like health care and uh, government funded education, things like that the way you see in Western Europe or Japan or Australia or many places of the developed world today. Now, don't be confused um, into thinking that everybody over here on the left is a Marxist and everybody over here on the right is a follower of Ayn Rand or economic libertarianism. Once you get into campaign season, people tend to try to cast their opponents as being more extreme than they really are. So somebody will run against a Democrat, say, here. They want voters to think that they're over here and vice versa. Also be wary that there are certain concepts that don't really fit on this spectrum very well, including the controversies over trade. Should we uh, put up tariffs or import duties to make foreign products more expensive? That's called protectionism, to protect American jobs or should we enjoy the advantages of free trade? Those, those sentiments tend to come and go over time, and there are people within each party that believe both things. And so the, that topic really transcends the political spectrum. This chapter also includes a section on the Federal Reserve, where banks bank, as some people say. And the Federal Reserve initially had a very big role in the economy, which is basically just distributing cash from the treasury out into the banking system, making sure that there were um, uh, there was currency out there spread evenly out around the country to the 12 regional banks, a place where people could swap um, torn or tattered bills for new crisp bills, that sort of thing. Today, it has a much bigger role where they attempt to manipulate the economy by manipulating interest rates. Now you could think of uh, money as costing money. And what I mean by that is if you're gonna borrow money, 
whether for student loans or to buy a house or to buy a, a car or a truck, then the higher the interest rate on that loan, obviously the more money you pay over the term of that loan. So the lower the interest rate, the more likely you are to buy things, which is what the government wants you to do. Especially if we go into a recession, they want you to have the confidence to buy things, and so they're gonna try to attempt to lower those interest rates. How they do that, I think, is best approached by looking at this graph first and then going over and doing the reading and trying to uh, commit this to memory. What do we get over here on this side is the kickstart idea where the Federal Reserve is going to send more money into the banking system right here in exchange for other assets like bonds, like U.S. Treasuries mainly, but it can include any sort of uh, bonds today. Then when there's more money out in the economy, then due to the laws of supply and demand, then the interest rates will be lower and you'll be more likely to pull the trigger on that next purchase. Why don't they just do that even more? Because more the better? Well, because if there's too much cash out in the economy, then that's going to cause inflation and dollars will just be worth less. So in order to control inflation over here, they do the exact same process in reverse. So you could think of the Federal Reserve as kind of a thermostat trying to get the temperature of the economy just right, not too hot, not too cold. They don't officially set the interest rates, but they can manipulate those interest rates through the laws of supply and demand. This chapter also includes a section on the term liberalism, liberal, which is a really difficult term to uh, nail down because it changes over time and space. When I say that it changes over time, I mean that historically its, its meaning has changed. Classical liberalism really in the 18th century, the early 19th century, really meant free markets in combination with Republican political freedoms like the right to vote, freedom of the press, um, et cetera, that we associate with the Western world. Liberalism is, is the whole package of what you get in Western Europe and the United States with the combination of democracy and capitalism. But over the course of the 19th and 20th century, people started to regulate the market more. Let's take, for example, an issue like pollution. If you have capitalism and democracy, um, through democracy people can vote and they might vote to regulate pollution. And so gradually the term came to mean more of a regulated economy. Regulated capitalism would be a good way to define liberalism today within the United States. So the term has changed a little bit over the last couple hundred years to mean a free market to more of a regulated market, but still a market, still one that relies on the basic um, laws of supply and demand, et cetera. The term also changes over space. And what do I mean by that is that internationally, people use the word more in the old fashioned sense of the word. So if, if somebody in ISIS says they hate liberalism, they're, they're not talking about people in the Democratic Party in the United States. They're talking about the whole United States. They're talking about all of Western Europe. If a commentator says, with Fidel Castro's death in Cuba, we're hoping that means that Cuba liberalizes their economy, they don't mean take the economy further to the left because it's already way to the left. It's already communist. What they mean is to th they're going to take the economy further to the right and bring our market forces into the economy. So the term gets confusing depending on what time period you're talking about and where you're talking about it. So if you get confused, don't feel bad because the vast majority of Americans would be confused about this. You might want to read the topic one more time, maybe after taking a look at the uh, Webster's Dictionary. The 1912 election is at the end of that chapter, chapter five, 
And this is an interesting election. Um, it was a four horse race. You can see here we got the Democrat Woodrow Wilson. And then the Republican ticket is really divided in half because you have the incumbent Taft, but then you have Theodore Roosevelt coming out of retirement and kind of creating a faction that, that in a way breaks off of the Republican Party that ends up getting named as the Progressive Party. And at this point, Theodore Roosevelt is really basically a democratic socialist. He believes, for instance, in universal health care insurance. Then you have a fourth candidate running who really is a democratic socialist, Eugene Debs. And so Roosevelt and Debs are going to take some votes from each other. Roosevelt and Taft are going to divide some votes from each other within the Republican Party. And the result is Woodrow Wilson is able to walk away with the election for the Democratic Party. And that has a couple long-term impacts. One of them is it starts to bring progressive policy into the Democratic Party slowly but surely. Wilson didn't really start off as a progressive, but he was president during the progressive era. And so things were happening around him that he eventually came to support. Things like, for instance, a new constitutional amendment to grant the government the right to redistribute wealth through a federal income tax. Presidents don't write constitutional amendments, but he was president when that happened. Eventually, uh, Roosevelt tries to um, extend this progressive spirit out onto the international stage by exporting democracy during and after World War I. As for the Republican Party, this was really the end of the progressive branch of the Republican Party in terms of being a separate party, like Roosevelt's Bull Moose faction. And progressivism begins to slowly fade away within the Republican Party. Probably the last real progressive that the Republicans had would have been Herbert Hoover, um, elected in 1928. A few others in the 1950s and 1970s, but not a lot. So by the time you get up to our time period, there's a lot more calcification and the Republican Party is cemented as the conservative party. The Democrats are cemented as the liberal party. But that was not true 100 years ago. 100 years ago, both parties had both factions within them. Now, as we move up to Chapter 6 on the Great War, which we now call World War I, one of the things I wanted to have you do early in that chapter there is distinguish between the immediate and the underlying causes of World War I. Because the underlying causes involve a lot of things that were occurring over the whole course of the 19th and early 20th century, including, for instance, the emergence of Germany as a consolidated country in Central Europe, which was causing concern on the part of the French and the Russians and the British, etc., especially as all these European countries were competing for overseas colonies in Africa and uh, the Middle East and Asia at the same time. And there's a big arms race that goes along with the industrial, industrial revolution. But you also have the decline of the Ottoman Empire down here in southeastern Europe and the Middle East. And that created a volatile situation here on the Balkan Peninsula where these countries wanted their independence. And the desire of one of those countries to maintain independence, Serbia, right here, that connects more to the immediate cause of the war which was Gavriel Princip's assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir apparent to the throne of Austria-Hungary up here, because as the Ottomans were retreating out of the Balkan Peninsula, Austria-Hungary was hoping to take advantage of that and expand their empire to the south. So there, uh, with World War I, um, we want to put a, a big focus on the U.S. because this is a U.S. history course. And I, I was always taught wrong, I think, when I was in your position. I came away with the idea that the sinking of the Lusitania is what brought the U.S. into the war. But that happened in 1915. And Woodrow Wilson was reelected on a peace platform in 1916. Most, most Americans agreed that the war did not concern the U.S. and that we should stay out. But gradually we began to get more and more involved, partly because Wall Street was lending money to the detente powers, um, the entente powers in, in France and, and Britain. 
And the more money we lent to them, the greater stake we had in making sure they were able to pay it back, which meant them winning. Um, but also you had Germany was trying to interrupt the flow of goods from the United States into Great Britain through submarine attacks out here. Like we saw that with, with the Lusitania. Um, but later you had the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare toward the end of the war. In order to understand why that was the case, I think once again you need to make sure to pay attention to geography. Because World War I was being fought on two fronts in Europe. And the Eastern War over here ended in 1917 between Russia and Germany, 1917, 1918. That relieved Germany of having to worry about this side. They then put all their troops over on the western side and tried to finish off France and Britain once and for all over here. As they did that, they rolled the dice and said, we're going to start sinking all American ships that are trying to supply the British and hopefully not aggravate the Americans enough to bring them into a war before we finish off France and Germany. France and, 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 and Britain. So it was, a, it was a kind of a race then on the part of Germany. Well, it didn't end up working, partly because Americans were upset about the submarine attacks, but also because Germany then tried to coax Mexico into attacking the southwestern United States to preoccupy the United States long enough to keep them out of World War I so that they could finish off um, France and Britain. Well, the British intercepted that telegram and gave it to Wilson. And for Wilson, this was a big contributing factor then to getting the United States into World War I. With this chapter, um, and with a lot of longer and more difficult chapters that you're going to be hitting here in, in units uh, three and four, some of them here in this unit, you know, make sure to take a break if you feel like you're getting tired. Get up, walk around, drink some water. Uh, or, you know, come back the next day and look at it. Because I've noticed in previous semesters that a lot of students were missing some questions about the Versailles Peace Conference at the end of the Great War, which is very important. The, the failure of the Versailles Peace Conference connects to World War II, which happened a generation later. And I, when I try to get to the bottom of why they missed these questions, I end up learning that they just basically ran out of fuel and just gave up and didn't read the rest of the chapter or tried to skim through it or something like that. So if you feel yourself getting tired, take a break. But make sure to read that section on the Versailles Peace Treaty and we revisit the flu pandemic at the end of that chapter as well. There's a, a section up further in uh, how it affected things domestically in the United States in the middle of the chapter. Then there's another section on the flu at the end. So make sure to hit both the Versailles Peace Treaty and the flu pandemic at the end of the Great War chapter. Um, but what we have risen here is a very fundamental question of whether the United States is just going to kind of stay isolationist, mind its own business, or are we going to step out onto the world stage and become an interventionist power where we're poking around here and there uh, policing the world? Wilson wanted to do the latter. That did not happen in his lifetime or in the 1920s and 30s, but for better or for worse, we did go in that direction, uh, not only during World War II, but especially after World War II and the Cold War and beyond up, into, up until the present. Um, moving on up into chapter seven, uh, the, the chapter um, includes a section on immigration, and it's one of those cases where once in a while, we'll get to a topic that has a lot of resonance today, and I'll just talk about how it impacts today. Um, but you can see here that the United States went through a period of tremendous immigration in the late 19th and early 20th century. And many people became U.S. citizens that a lot of so-called Native Americans, uh, uh, Protestants from Northern and Western Europe, that is, not American Indians, um, didn't see as being truly American. Is the American identity going to be multiracial? Is it going to be diverse? Or is American identity rooted in white Protestant so-called WASPs, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants? That's an ongoing issue. We, we debated a lot today also. Um, we too live in a period where there was tremendous increased immigration. 
from 1965 on up to the present after the United States liberalized its immigration policies. Um, there's been a lot of influence in the United States. And once again, there's this big pushback on, is that enough? Are we going to try to cut off immigration or not? And you guys are living in an era where the Democratic Party and the Republican Party have diverged widely on this issue of immigration, with the Republican Party really resuscitating more of the 1920s attitude almost, and the Democratic Party, at least the more progressive branch of the Democratic Party, um, seemingly unwilling to even have the government control immigration or enforce the borders at all. So there's a gigantic gap between the two political parties now, and you need to be thinking about these issues as a citizen moving forward. These, the, the backdrop of that, I think, or the subtext of this argument over immigration is really voting. And the fact that immigrants tend to vote more Democrat Republicans realize that. Democrats also realize that. So uh, there's a big kind of fight for control over the future of the country, excuse me, going on, which centers on immigration. And Texas is a, is a perfect example of that. If Texas were to swing blue, so to speak, that would swing the whole country in, the, in favor of the Democrats in terms of presidential elections. So you live in an interesting time when it comes to immigration. The Democratic Party, uh, all political parties struggle to create big umbrellas, big umbrella coalitions, really. It's not like everybody's all on the same page within any party that's big enough to get 51% of the vote. So there's a lot of argumentation within political parties, both on immigration and other issues. The Democrats of the 1920s were no exception to that. The Democrats were, in effect, the losers of the Civil War. They were the remnants of the Confederacy. They were the, the racist party. They were the party of the Klan in the South in the late 19th and early 20th century, and that served them well in the South. They dominated the so-called Solid South. But they were also trying to reinvent themselves in the North as a party that appealed to immigrants and minorities and the people that were coming into the country to work in the mines and the factories. That worked well for them there also. They were the party that tended to control these so-called political machines that we talked about in Chapter 2 in big cities like New York. But you can imagine when those two groups tried to get together and nominate or elect a president like Al Smith, you can see over here, that they were going to have lots of problems. The only thing that, that allowed the Democrats to fuse together in the 1930s was the severity of the Great Depression. And the, the Great Depression and World War II forced them to temporarily push their differences aside. But the very moment World War II was over, what happened to the Democratic Party? Once again, splintered back off into the same two groups, who then argued it out for control of the party all the way on up until the mid-1960s when the liberals got control of the party and basically kicked the, the Southern racists out. Okay. Um, moving on up into chapter eight, we're talking about the Great Depression. Don't ask yourself what caused the Great Depression. Was it this or that? It can be more than one thing at the same time, especially if they're not mutually exclusive. Um, it can be a combination of factors. It can be a perfect storm. We had problems in real estate brought on by the decline of immigration. We had pro weather problems with the Great Drought or excuse me, the, the big drought on the Great Plains and the Dust Bowl. We had the saturation of the durable goods market where a lot of these new goods that came and, and bolstered the economy in the 1920s were a little too durable, which is to say that the people who had them and could afford them didn't really need new ones yet. Um, we had problems with, with too much credit and people borrowing too much money to buy these goods, people borrowing money to invest in a, a thriving stock market. And then we had a stock market that was getting a little too expensive in terms of the price of the stock in blue in relation to the earnings of companies here in red, P-E ratio as it's called. When that gets out of whack, there tends to be a correction. Now, I tended to learn that the stock market crash caused the Great Depression 
I think it's a little more complicated than that. I think you can ask yourself the question of is the stock market crash, was that a symptom of a of an ongoing recession that was already kicking in? First of all, this crash um, is not something that just happened in 1929. Here's 1929 up here. It's really what happened in 30, 31, 32, and 33. That's the true crash. You get an 89% reduction in overall uh, capital in the stock market. So this really occurred over a number of years. And at first, I think people thought, well, wealthy people are really the only ones who invest in the stock market. That's only 16% of Americans owned any stock. Maybe they'll buy fewer Cadillacs or yachts or something. Not going to be a huge problem. But I want you to also look at how that's connected to the rest of the economy because banks were also investing money in the stock market. They were investing our money in the stock market. So hardworking Americans would put money in a savings account and the way banks make money is they go make more money with your money than they're paying you interest to hold your money. That spread is their basic business plan. So um, they were investing a lot in the stock market. When the stock market crashed, they were starting to lose a lot of money and then people were losing faith in their banks and the bank doesn't have everybody's money sitting there in the vault. They have it out working. So if everybody rushes the bank at the same time and there's a bank panic, then you get the self-fulfilling prophecy of a bank failure. And sure enough, the bank goes down and there was no insurance against that. The government wasn't behind banks um, up until 1933 and 1934. So, uh, I think that's how the stock market crash sort of connected to the rest of the economy. These bank failures are at the heart of the Great Depression. Now, what did Herbert Hoover do about it? Contrary to popular belief, um, he was not a laissez-faire Republican in the, the style of, say, uh, Harding or Coolidge, his predecessors. His Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon, was, but he wasn't really. He wanted to do some things about it. One thing that he did about it was he tried to protect American jobs by signing off on the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which made foreign competitors more expensive in an effort to protect American jobs. That That's fool's gold, inevitably. That seems like a good idea. That seems like something that's going to work. But a lot of economists and a lot of industry leaders like Henry Ford knew that it wouldn't work because we also export. And when we export and then we put up a big tariff, then other countries are going to put up retaliatory tariffs. It's just going to lead to a big downturn in trade. And that's what happened with the Smoot-Hawley tariff. One thing that Paul Krugman points out, an economist with the New York Times, is that this downturn in world trade predated the Smoot-Hawley tariff. So it's a good example of paying good close attention to um, chronology. Chronology matters. I don't ask you to memorize a lot of dates or anything like that, but if the Smoot-Hawley tariff kicked in in the 19, early 1930s, and then this graph shows that world trade was already plummeting at a, at a high degree in 1929, then yes, that matters. Um, but either way, the Smoot-Hawley tariff didn't help things out. Um, but Hoover tried to do other things, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, uh, which was the idea of not just giving people money, not a handout, but using the government to invest in banking and infrastructure and things like that to help get the economy up and rolling. That's an idea that Franklin Roosevelt basically adopted and made as a centerpiece of the New Deal all the way on up through early part of World War II. And it's an idea that the government employed during the financial meltdown of 2008-2009 during this so-called bailout of Wall Street, which, during which the government did not give money to Wall Street, but rather loaned and invested in Wall Street banks. There's a big difference. That comes from the RFC. Hoover would have loved to have put people to work building things that needed to be built anyway, like a highway system, which we didn't have, even though we had cars. Um, or dredging the St. Lawrence Seaway and making it possible for ocean-going freighters to go back and forth between the Atlantic and the Great Lakes. He wanted to do that. But this is another important lesson. Presidents don't run everything. Presidents are not dictators in the United States. He was unable to do those things because Congress blocked those ideas. 
Later, Franklin Roosevelt was able to do many of the same things and had success, but that's because he had a cooperative Congress working with him. So that's one of the big differences there. So uh, I guess that's it for now. Um, that went a little bit longer than I was hoping it would. Um, I'm told by the uh, distance learning office that you guys' attention span doesn't exceed 15 minutes. I'm not supposed to have any videos up that last longer than that. So I apologize for that, but I think your attention span is a little bit longer. But these are some of the more difficult learning objectives that I think will help prepare you for uh, the Unit 2 exam. Thank you.